You can tell I love words. Um, and ever since I was a little boy, I loved to write, I loved to read, I loved to read what other people said, and I loved to read um, uh, what people said across the years. So this is not, uh, what you're hearing here today, what you've learned in your schoolwork is relatively recent. We didn't talk about the boys changing voice from an empirical standpoint, we talked about it from an anecdotal standpoint. Um, so we have some issues, one used to be an issue of not having good models of choral performance. Well, thanks to uh, Alan and this conference, we have models of good choral performance. That was an issue. When I started out, there had never, when I was in, in, in my earliest uh, years in school, there was the first ACDA children's choir performance on a conference with uh, Doreen Rao leading it. It was heresy. People didn't know what to do with a children's choir at ACDA. When I was in my fourth year of teaching, there was the first ACDA middle school honor choir conducted by Lynn Gappel, your friend down here in Baylor, um, who, uh, it was, people walked out. I was her accompanist for that concert. People came in and accused her of, how dare you put this on a conference? We don't do middle school. They don't sing well. Those days are over. You have something which is remarkable here in this conference and in the leadership by Alan. Thank you so much for making this available and a non-issue anymore. We have models of choral performance. But we also have some other issues that we need to deal with when we're working with adolescents and adolescent boys. We know, for instance, developmentally there are some things that we need to keep in mind. For instance, cognitive development parallels age and experience, but not puberty. Think about that. All of these 12-year-olds uh, are in the same math class but they're not at the same maturity level physically or um, uh, 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 in terms of how they enter puberty or when they enter puberty. But their puberty timing is tied to their emotional and motivational development. And so that's why you can have so many different moods and so many different temperaments in uh, the same group of 12-year-olds, uh, particularly 12-year-old boys. So we need to keep in mind that although cognitively they may be functioning at the same level, emotionally development developmentally they may be all over the place. Because of the research which is now going on about actually asking boys about what they think and how they feel during adolescence, just not just in choral music but elsewhere, we now know that self-esteem for boys is as much an issue as it is for girls. We've known that for a long time. We've known that the lowest level of self-esteem for girls is about grades eight or nine. We now know the same is true for boys. They're just not telling us because we're not asking. We need to change that. Um, we, another interesting thing that's uh, being uh, suggested by research is that if the whole body's changing, wouldn't the uh, auditory system be changing as well? And so there's a period of time in which boys actually may not, some boys may actually not be able to perceive the pitch that we're trying to have them match. So if we go over to the piano, we bang the note out, they're not doing it, so we bang it harder and harder and harder and harder, and they don't get it. Well, it's time to move our focus to something else. What else can they do besides pitch match? They can do vowels, they can do rhythm, they can do all sorts of different things except pitch match. And that comes around. It's developmental. And we need to remember that the auditory system is developmental as well. Um, uh, then motivational. We know, for instance, that boys, uh, they tell us now that they want to know about the vocal technique and the vocal anatomy. They want to know the how to sing, not just my voice is changing. Deal with it. Uh, they, they want to acquire skills. That's important to boys. That keeps them coming back. You heard that this morning. Uh, they need specific feedback in the point A, going back to point A in the cycle. Uh, they need specific feedback about, about what they did, how they did it, and what they're going to do next to make it even better. They need challenging multi-voiced repertoire. Have you heard this before? Yes. Um, but we know that not motivators for many boys is the perfection of that repertoire. Some boys, yes. Uh, but not, not all. What they want to learn are the skills, not necessarily the drill that gets them to the perfection of that repertoire. Um, we also know that choir, contrary to our beliefs, because we want choir to be an academic subject, choir is still perceived by kids to be an extracurricular activity because of all of the things that happen outside of school. So we, we can bang our head against the wall a lot by saying kids don't value choir, they don't view it as an academic subject. Well, they don't. So what are we going to do with that? How do we work within that? Um, structurally, structurally in our school as well as perceptually among the kids. We also know important for us that bullying and harassment are issues for boys in choral music because they actively seek 
or avoid choir in high school because of this. So s some boys will have opposite reactions. Some boys will join choir because it can be a refuge. Other boys will seek to not be associated with choir because of the sense of bullying and harassment. And that's not only individual to the school, but it's also individual to the boy. So in other words, there's a lot going on. Um, I conducted a study uh, that was triggered by the 30th anniversary of a research project by Leonard Van Camp. Leonard Van Camp wrote in the Coral Journal about 30 years ago, my first year of teaching. He wrote, I am convinced that we are in fact in the middle of a serious crisis. We must find the time to get better acquainted with the students with whom we work. What are they seeking? Where are they going? What are their hopes, dreams, fears, and desires? How can we serve, and that's what teaching should be, if we do not know those whom we are serving? We had better be listening all the time. They are trying to tell us how to help them. Leonard Van Camp was a choir director at the University of Southern uh, Illinois, uh, Edwardsville, and he was concerned that there were a very few and a declining number of males coming into his, high, coming into his college choirs. So he w went and uh, surveyed teachers. He traveled to all 50 states and talked about what is the problem, what's going on. And at the end of it, his grand conclusion, I'm talking to the wrong people. I don't need to be talking to the teachers. I need to be talking to the boys. What are they saying? And so he called for research that would look at what boys were saying and then what that would mean for practice. What are the implications for practice and how can we tie that to the research? Um, so uh, a, a, this review of that research since Leonard Van Camp's call was a comprehensive review of all published narrative research studies with adolescent boys about singing and their perceptions of the choral experience. I looked at journal articles and edited book chapters so that there was some kind of uh, peer review there. Um, uh, all told, there are only 22 studies uh, in multiple languages. And uh, 22 sounds like a lot, but it also sounds like not a lot. There's more work to be done. Uh, for instance, I've got studies coming out in the next uh, year or so dealing with boys in Colombia, Austria, and other countries continuing the, to build on the, on the research that's out there. If you're looking for a research topic, that might be something you could do too, especially if you love words. Uh, most of the research in music ed uh, are by authors in the Australia and the United States. Most of the work that's uh, contributed by authors in the UK and England are uh, looking at the cathedral boy choir tradition. And you may see some differences in some of the quotes that we'll see in a moment uh, that re refer to that a little bit. Uh, from all of this, I was able to extract seven themes. And so for the themes that we'll explore today, each one will get a smattering of quotes from the boys, but there's much more to be found in the, in the original research. And if you'd like to know where all these sources come from, uh, just send me an email. My email address will be up on the last slide, or you can just Google me and I'll send you a list of all of the research that's um, in this presentation. Um, sorry, I'm gonna go back here. Important to remember that we have camps people who disagree, people who have different opinions in our field, no more so than in middle school, junior high. Um, and we need to be uh, concerned and skeptical about someone who criticizes another person without any kind of uh, back, uh, empirical background, any kind of rational other, rationale other than just saying, because I said so. Um, and we also need to remember that different studies involve different populations. They diff involve different kinds of boys in different kinds of settings. There's a huge difference between a boy who is sung continuously in a high-powered, well-crafted, well-taught choral program from age uh, you know, seven through 17 versus a boy who walks into your seventh grade class, says hi, or gets dumped, as, as, as the term might be, into your seventh grade class by the, general, by the guidance counselor and says hi, and have never sung before. That's not the same kind of boy. We're not gonna teach that boy the same way. And so we need to keep in mind that different studies are similarly um, geared to, uh, and dealing with different kinds of boys and perhaps with different kinds of outcomes. And then uh, the last point on the slide is, remember that each point of view is a point of view. Maybe we can aggregate them together and combine them to come up with a theme as I tried to do here, but each point of view is each boy's point of view much like yours is your point of view. Your job, I think, as a teacher is to figure out what works for me within the context of what we know about what works for kids. So let's move on a little bit. So of these themes, first theme is, we know that boys are attracted to choral singing when their friends join together as a group. 
Paul Caldwell did a study a few years ago uh, of, for a singing organization in Chicago. And he surveyed the kids and the, teach and the, the parents who sent the kids to this organization. All the parents said they sent the kids there for aesthetic musical learning. Almost all of the kids said the reason they joined and the reason they liked it, for their friends. Uh, so we need to stop worrying about that. Joining an organization is a good thing. If there is a social component. We need to know that that's really important to boys. Uh, Koi said, I gained a lot of friendships when I went into choir because of all that camaraderie, you know? It was one of those things where everybody enjoyed it just because we were friends. We were buddies. And so we just sort of hung out together and enjoyed each other's company. Billy said, and by the way, Billy is someone who dropped out of choir. Uh, because he didn't have a friend. He said, maybe if I met somebody who was really nice and he was doing the chorus and he kind of motiv motivated me to do it, I would. If there was other guys beginning to sing, perhaps it'd be good, it'd be fun. I just don't like singing alone. Singing in a group would be a lot better. Uh, and, and then a boy from Spain said, other boys are not cool, but we are. There is a special relationship among us. We are the ones. Have you ever seen a choir uh, go out and like an honor choir during the break? It's like geeks go to heaven, choir geeks go to heaven. They just love it. It's so much fun. Um, kids like working together as a group with other people who are like them. So they're attracted to choral singing as a group. By the way, that backs up research about how kid, boys especially transition between elementary to middle and from middle school to high school. There's lots of information about how we attract uh, 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 recruit boys and how we uh, uh, retain them in our programs. You might have to look outside music education literature from time to time to find some of that. A second theme is that boys like to sing. Shocker. Sometimes we think boys don't like chorus and we equate that with boys not liking to sing. Research doesn't show that. Boys do like to sing, but they don't always like to sing in choir. Uh, a boy from Singapore said, I do not sing in a choir and tend to look at myself as a bathroom singer because, well, the only place I sing is in the bathroom when I'm showering, so no one will ever hear me. Uh, one of the uh, things that boys try to do during voice change or during adolescence is hide. Some of the things that girls try to do during adolescence is hide or withdraw. And one of th those areas is, of course, singing. So some, we find that a lot of boys will say, okay, singing is something I like to do, but I'll do it in private because I'm embarrassed to do it or I don't know what's gonna happen with my voice. Uh, uh, another boy from Singapore uh, was drawing on some research where I did where I had him draw, had the boys in the study draw pictures of themselves at different points in their lives as singers and then comment on those pictures. Uh, the picture I drew shows me performing live as the vocalist in front of a band. This is because rock music suits my musical taste, and I prefer singing songs that I listen to rather than singing choral songs. So just because someone isn't interested in choir doesn't mean they don't like to sing. We need to uh, separate those two thoughts. Uh, Mark said, I never learned anything about my changing voice, not a word. Maybe if I learned more, maybe I could have improved and joined one of the much better choirs. I'd like to be one of the school's leading vocalists. I'd like that, but I'm not. So here, um, Mark was saying that we uh, can gain the skills that we need to sing however we want. We can gain those skills in choir and then apply them outside of choir. And he felt gypped because he didn't get it. Third theme, boys want to learn vocal technique but they don't often learn it in choir. We talked earlier today about direct instruction and where you use the warm-up session especially to uh, teach the material, the, the key concepts that will be encountered later on in the repertoire that you've planned through the rehearsal. Assuming you've planned the rehearsal. Um, that's a good thing. So, uh, and boy, one of the things that the boys want to learn in that process is vocal technique. They're uh, frustrated when it doesn't happen. Roger said, maybe if there was some instruction on how the voice works, like we learn how muscles work when we play sports. It helps with our training and coordination, and it helps us know how we can improve our skills. That would probably help out in chorus a lot, especially with guys who are getting frustrated with their voice range and that just awkward zone, because you, you just hit a crack, and it'd be an ex excellent thing to teach if it could be absorbed. So he's saying, I want my choral teachers to teach me like other teachers who are teaching me to use my developing body. And here he is equating it to sports and coaches. 
Gerald said, I can't reach the high notes. The long notes are hard for me to sing too. I couldn't really hold on to them. I feel like everything is changing and nobody is helping me anymore. Again, you heard that this morning when we talked about find the part that matches the kid. Don't try to match, don't try to force the kid to sing a part just because you want him to. Find the part that matches the kid and then teach them how to sing it. Third um, quote here is, uh, I think it would help if singers got to know which muscles they use when they use their vocal instrument to sing. Here we have technique again. I think that would help a lot because you would understand what you were doing when you did it. Aha, <laughs> that's called teaching, right? <laughs> we want them to understand what they're doing when they do it. Remember, it's not about you and it's not even about the choral performance. It's about what happens after they walk off the stage. What are they able to do because they learned with you and because they had that choral performance? What happens after? Fourth theme, many boys dislike the emphasis on public performances versus skill development. This theme was a bit of a surprise to me, but it was prevalent enough uh, that it became its own theme. Fico said, I like my voice. It's kind of wild, so I need to learn how to use it. I want to be a confident singer before I have to sing in front of an audience. Don't put me on stage if I'm not ready. This should not have been a surprise to me because Frederick Swanson wrote about this in 1958 in Music Educator's Journal. He was talking, writing for teachers about what do you do with boys whose voices are changing when you're teaching in a mixed classroom where you have boys and girls. And he said, I, I separate them. I take them out of the room and I tell the boys, you're gonna work with me and you are not going to go back into that choir until you're ready and you tell me you're ready and you're confident. And then mix them back. So there is an idea to think about when we talk about should we have separate gender choirs or separate sex choirs and, and, uh, or not. And the thought maybe it's not either or, maybe it's and. Uh, we pull them out from a time and put them back uh, when they're ready. But boys are sometimes embarrassed to sing until they're confident singing with others both in the rehearsal and on the stage. Nick said, the style of singing in a classical chorus just limits individual contribution of masculine singers. Now, if we dig into that for a second, our definition of masculine is different than what most adolescent boys view as masculine. What they view as masculine is the style of singing, the style of performance, which is conductor in front and everybody else doing exactly what the conductor sa says. Adolescent boys value individuality and autonomy. This is not just from the choral literature, this is from every kind of research about adolescent boys. And when you teach in one way, where all kids have to learn in one way, that is not individualization, that is not honoring autonomy, that is not differentiated instruction. So your instruction could, if it were differentiated to different kinds of kids involving six or seven different changes within each rehearsal different, uh, that allow you to move around and interact with different kids and hit that kid's needs over here for two seconds and that kid's needs over there for 30 seconds, that's what they value. It's the style of teaching that is the problem when it's also the same as the style of performance. Uh, when you look at research about church, since we've had conversations about church already today, um, Who's leaving church settings? By the way, in most church settings, it's just like this, right? You got a preacher, you got a leader, and people are all sitting in rows paying attention. Who's withdrawing? Adolescent boys and young adult men. They're leaving in droves. It's not matching how they value themselves in the world and how they like to learn. Same thing is true in choral music. Uh, so Joshua said, I like it when the entire group combines their abilities and sings as one voice. So a different point of view here. Singing done well is an expressive language for when I am unable to express myself due to a dilemma. I am a bass and I love low notes. I do not like why basses do always do not get the main melody part in an SATB choir. So how many challenges do you want to give boys whose voices are changing at the same time? All right, okay, you have to sing in a clef I've never seen before and no one's ever taught me about before, right? Think about that. Whose responsibility is it, responsibility is it to teach the bass clef? 
you know, and you need to check in if you're getting the kids from another school, and you need to know what they know. Don't just hand them out a piece of music and say, sing this line. What was a low, or what was a high note, now is a low note. And if they don't know that, because you never pointed it out, that's a problem. And they're singing a harmony part, sort of, kind of, that's not really like a thir in thirds or sixths, and it's not really the fundamental of the chord. It's some kind of awkward, weird harmony part hanging out in the middle. How many uh, challenges do you want to throw at a kid all at once and then say, why are you dropping out of choir? Well, duh. So uh, maybe we find opportunities for boys uh, to sing melody from time to time. Uh, 15, boys who have older vocal role models tend to have higher rates of persistence, meaning they stay in longer. Uh, and those vocal role models can be parents, but they could be just older kids. But it, uh, what I have found is in every single uh, boy that I've talked with who stayed in singing throughout the whole uh, adolescence and, and into high school, that boy, every boy, everyone that I've studied can name who his role model was. They may not have a proper name, like a Billy or Bob or whatever, but they can remember who the kid was, who they saw, who came into the rehearsal, who worked with them, what they were wearing. They can name that role model. Can you? Can you name who it was that you valued when you were a kid as a singer? Who's that role model? All the boys who stayed in singing can name one. Uh, Roger said, I find it interesting about how I've started talking about my father. It's not like I'd ever realized how much of an impact that he had on my singing. I mean, he's good. He's legitimately good. I've just always looked to my dad for sports, and now just looking at him musically, he's a very skilled man. Other role models. One of my friends didn't know how to sing falsetto, and one of the seniors took him into another choir and taught him how to sing falsetto. We really looked up to them. They were telling it like it was. It was, it was stuff they had learned from personal experience. The older guys were the ones who would give us more of the examples, like when the conductor would say, sing it like this, they would sing it back, and then she'd change them a bit, and then we would learn from them. It was like passing it down, passing down of the lesson, which was great, because we worked hard and we appreciated their musicianship and stuff like that. So uh, use the older experienced boys as well as the chronologically older boys. Uh, maybe look for opportunities for singing of high school with middle school boys and so forth. We know about role model research that it does need to skip a generation though. So if you're working in a college, you need to be bringing your college choir down to the middle school because they look different enough that they're not like, you know, they don't share the same pimples and all that sort of stuff, but they are not close enough in age that I can't really tell a difference between me and them. So sometimes bringing the high school down to the middle school is too close. Instead, bring college to middle school and bring high school to elementary. That's where the role model needs to be. So the research shows that the, the difference in the aspirational peer, the person that you want to be like, has to be separated by a generation. And when we're talking about kids, generation is like a, from middle school to high and so forth. Um, speaking to this, Clark said, I remember that we had students from the high school in their senior year. Some of the, them would come down to the lower school and actually intern almost, sort of like be a teacher's aide. And I remember when they came to our chorus class, we were all really impressed. We asked them a lot of questions about changing voices, and it was pretty fun. One boy of the three, he was the best singer. And I thought it was really cool just to be able to have fun with singing. I once uh, did a, a series of interviews in a school where every single kid I interviewed, every single boy I interviewed, named the same kid as the role model. He was a high school uh, singer. He was actually in a rock band. And then I, I interviewed that kid. And he was just blown away. Sometimes you don't know that you're the role model. So when I like do an honor choir or something like that, I'll, I'll impress on the kids that you don't know who's watching you, but someone's watching you and wants to be just like you. Maybe you can facilitate some of that as a teacher. Sixth theme, boys withdraw from choral singing when not taught how to sing through the change process. And this is where your skill as a voice teacher comes in. Alex said, it was not a matter of the, ma of the boys changing voice when singing. It was not a problem for me. I am excited to continue singing despite the problems I have faced. But with other boys, it's different. And they have had bad experiences with the voice changes. They just quit. Actually, right now, I really prefer rugby to singing. Because singing is getting tiring and worse as I get older. And, well, rugby, I'm getting better as I get older. 
I'm kind of at the end of my singing life, at least for treble I am. I almost don't feel like I have time to get any better because my voice is about to change. Have we taught boys about the voice change? Not just it's going to change, but what's going to change? What are you going to experience? And what's happening inside, uh, physically, anatomically, that's creating that change? And what's the change process going to be? How many stages is it going to be? What are my ranges going to be? And how will I know when I'm halfway through and almost? You, we know that information. You should know that information. And if you don't, email me. I'll send you the, uh, the, either the information or uh, links to it so that you can find it because that's what kids crave. It's not your voice is going to change and then it'll be done. That's not good enough. So give them the information that they crave and need. My teacher didn't really concentrate on the whole voice change and she couldn't really teach it to us as well as she should have. So boys dropped out because they thought their voices had changed for the worse and not for the better. So think about that. Uh, again, why the allure of sports? Because in most sports, if you've got a decent teacher, you have a coach or a, a phys ed teacher who's teaching you how to use your body and the changes in your body during uh, adolescence. Do we do the same in choral music? It's physical. We should be. Seven, personal relationships with friends and teachers are by far the most important factors in recruitment and persistence. We alluded to this a little earlier. Um, if there's not a strong sense of unity, I don't think I would stay. But if there is, and everybody is really friendly toward one another, then that would be the driving force for me to stay. So more than anything else, it's the friendships and the relationships. Mark said, guys are usually very good singers when they are little. They work hard at singing. The teacher works with them. And then their voice breaks. And they don't know what to do after that. It's weird, isn't it? It must be frustrating for the teachers to have to start all over again. They get it. They understand. Be, so be open with the kids. Remember, you're learning as much from them as they're learning from you. And I think that's a good conversation to have and a, and a, and a good way to approach it. You will never know everything. Uh, but you can know more by involving those boys whose voices are changing in the conversation. How are you feeling today? What are you noticing? What's different than yesterday? Tell me when you think you need to be singing a different voice part. And then that's an opportunity to have an instant voice lesson, three-minute voice lesson. <laughs> if you think you need to switch parts, ha, ha, they're coming to you for a voice lesson. Uh, and that, that works really well. Uh, the choir is like a family. If somebody screws up, it's okay. We don't mind. It doesn't matter. Some people still tease me for singing and call me gay, but when I sing, I feel more confident. When I sing, it's like I change, and this new person comes out of me. I think I've evolved over the past year, and in the end, all that really matters is what I think about myself. So it's the team that, uh, the family, that creates the persistence, that creates the boy singing because he feels good about what he's doing and his capabilities. So what does this all mean? And the rest of the quotes that you haven't seen uh, uh, all can be drawn down to some implications. So what does this mean for how we teach? Here are four. Uh, boys say that I want to learn to sing, but my teacher focuses on the notes and rhythms of the repertoire. Plus, I can't sing the printed voice part because it's either too high or too low. Felipe said, you can't try to make the young boy go all the way low, and you can't make them try to sing high soprano. Most of the time, the directors just choose the music, and you have to sing it no matter what your voice is. So the implications here are, we need to rethink our role from choir director to group voice teacher. I would advocate that our job is group voice teacher who uses choral repertoire as the learning material for vocal technique and pitches and rhythms and notation. And, but our first task is how to sing. The choral music is the what to sing. So our, uh, I disagree with uh, members of my profession who say that the choral repertoire is the curriculum. No. I think uh, vocal technique is the curriculum and rep choral repertoire serves that vocal technique. It may also be, that equation may be a little different depending on the kinds of groups that you have. If you have an, a top-rated sweepstakes um, audition choir, 
okay, that may be different than their year all come choir where the kids are dumped in, as the phrase goes, from the, by the uh, guidance counselors. Totally different situation. Maybe that equation's a little different. But think about what your role is. Is it how to sing or is it what to sing? Uh, sorry, and I'm going to go back here for a second. The tessitura of the music must match the tessitura of the boy's voice. So if you're, and this is what we were talking about when we did the phrase by phrase example with Judy earlier, uh, the, the music that you choose must match the boy who's being asked to sing it. If there's not a match there, that repertoire is not going to work. So you have to know the boy's voice before the repertoire. And it's possible that you're going to have to shift that boy or that repertoire during the course of the instruction. So just be prepared for all of that sort of thing. Uh, Judy also mentioned earlier today the use of children's choir repertoire. Why? Because mo lots of children's choir repertoire has, is written in multiple parts, especially lots of the world or multicultural music, has multiple voice parts. And if you examine them, you can find them where they'll have different kinds of ranges for each of those voice parts. And then th that kind of repertoire might also be good for teaching material. I have more on that if I just lost you there, but ask me a question about that later. So uh, some other things. Uh, boys say, I need to experience quality, success, and autonomy. Implications there are that we need to teach boys about their current and emerging voices. Let them tell you when their voice has made a change and provide as detailed information as you know. And if you don't know as detailed information as you want to know, go learn more and then bring that into your teaching. Uh, a lot of people will ask me, what's the first thing I need to do if I need to rethink my role as a choral director away from just directing the music to actually teaching the, uh, the skills and techniques of how to sing? And my answer is take voice lessons. Take voice lessons and then turn around tomorrow and teach what you learned in your voice lesson the day before, as is applicable to the kids. Um, I once had to teach singer's diction in college. <laughs> I was literally one night ahead of everyone in the class. I had no clue. Don't, you know, there's a reason my choirs never sing in French. Um, so, <laughs> not gonna happen. But, you know, I was literally, okay, that was my job. I had to learn so that I could teach the kids. It's your job. Learn, sing in a choir, take voice lessons, go to workshops. Uh, uh, number four, teach repertoire that is both accessible and musically rich. Are there opportunities in the music to engage the kids over time in deeper and deeper exploration of the music and how to sing it? If the repertoire is the same on pages one and two as it is on pages seven and eight, that might not be the best piece of music to choose. As you're listening to the repertoire being performed by the choirs here today, think about how much of the music has a sudden shift or has a surprise or has changes that you wouldn't know if you only heard the first couple pages. But if we look at the preponderance of the repertoire that's sold to us as being ideal for your choir, it's probably ideal for the musicians in front of the choir, the conductors, who can't really do a good job. If you can't really do a good job, you're not at this university. <laughs> you're at this university because you have the musical skills you have. Remember, don't stop being a musician the second your senior recital's over. That's when it begins. Take everything you've learned and translate that to the classroom. The kids need that, and they will stay with you if they trust that you're bringing them that, uh, that, that knowledge and that skill through the repertoire that is rich musically and accessible to them. So some motivational implications. Boys say, remember, I'm a whole boy with a life inside and outside of the choir room. I am not just a changing voice. Rick said, the truth is I was still a soprano and all you guys were tenors and basses and I couldn't sit with you anymore. I didn't even mind singing soprano. It's just that like you were all growing up and becoming men and I wasn't. And I didn't want to be like younger and everything because then you guys would be the leaders and I, I would just be some immature little kid like a grade six or something. So remember these kids are different developmentally and some of you were that little boy who developed later than everyone else or that little girl who developed later than everyone else. That's hard, and you probably didn't complain about it because you were gonna be squashed. Um, so, you know, that's a hard thing. 
Um, but what we want to do is make uh, applications of vocal technique to all kinds of music, remembering that kids are not only different in what they're singing, what voice part they're singing, but also what kinds of music they like. How can we apply what I've learned here today to what I sing outside of school, or my favorite pop song, or my favorite whatever? That makes it more interesting to the kids and maybe more applicable too, so that it's not choral music isn't just what I'm learning in school, but it's singing that I'm applying in many different contexts throughout my life, just like you do. Probably, I would think. Um, so, uh, boys say the loss of the childhood voice can be traumatic. This was a surprise to me, but it shouldn't have been because I experienced this while I taught elementary school, and I didn't quite know the context. Frederick said, sometimes in my school I just sing a little song, or in my room I sing a little song. I used to be quite good, but I, now I'm not. I'm sad because I kind of liked singing high notes when I was good. Everybody said I was good. And then when I got to year six and my voice started cracking, my teacher took my part away when I couldn't sing the high notes. I had even learned it by heart. So music became something I wasn't good at anymore. No one taught him what was going to happen next. He just knew, okay, if I can't do it anymore the way I used to, then I'm not very good. My voice change was like torture. I had the most precious thing taken from me, my soprano voice. Beware of giving too much praise to the boy soprano without helping him transition to what's coming next. We do a disservice to kids when we build up that and we equate the voice with the boy. Um, it, you are not a saxophone. You are not a tuba. You are a tuba player and a saxophone player and a voice player. Your voice is going to change. Play your voice. Let's learn how to play your voice so that we can use uh, our voice as it goes through the stages of change. How many of you were kicked out of choir when your voice started to change? I can tell you the day. I can tell you what I was wearing. I can tell you where I was in the room. I'm only here because of a set of coincidences, which I can tell you later. But had it not been for another teacher years later, I was in the wrong room in the wrong place, but actually was I, <laughs> who said, okay, let's see what your voice can do instead of here's what your voice can't do. No way I would be up here right now. I never thanked that teacher. Have you thanked yours? Um, so the loss of the childhood voice can be traumatic. Um, some other implications, uh, again, from this research. Uh, I think constant, as Chris said here, I think constant singing throughout the range was keeping everything alive, because if you don't use it, you lose it. My teacher made my voice change a very good experience. I didn't feel bad about losing my treble voice at all. Chris um, says here uh, something very important, that uh, singing throughout the range constantly was important. So uh, you probably have heard the name Henry Leck uh, as, as someone who talks about this singing through the range. He's actually continuing a line of pedagogues and researchers that goes back for some time. And for boys who sing continuously, guess what? The um, vocal mechanism, the muscular coordination, the muscular conditioning is much more uh, uh, suitable and, and helpful for when the voice starts to change. You've laid the foundation for singing through the voice change. It's a very different thing if you come into seventh grade and you've got a kid who hasn't sung for three years. Hi, work with me. That's different than the kid who's sung all along. Um, they have different skills, different needs. Uh, implications here. Teach boys, young boys, elementary boys, about the coming voice change. And then regard singing as a skill, not as a gift. You have such a wonderful voice. is very different than look what you can do with your voice. Think of it as a skill, not a gift. Adolescence is a time of extreme emotional vulnerability. The voice, can, my voice change can make it worse. Choir can make it better. We know that the choral classroom can be a place of refuge, and that's where classroom climate comes in. That's what you create. Those are all those uh, structures you set up in the classroom to make classroom a safe place. They're also the things that you can undo with one phrase. We've all seen it, right? We've been in a class where the teacher just said one thing exactly the wrong way, and it destroyed what was going on. Unless the teacher stepped back and said, okay, guys, I just made a mistake. 
here's what I did. You have to own it up when you make mistakes. You will all the time. It's important. We want kids to own it when they make a mistake. We have to own it as well. So don't get too hard on yourself when things go wrong and you say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, as long as you come back to the kids immediately and explain it and have a come to papa or mama moment, you know, kind of thing. Um, uh, important thing in this making it a safe place is avoid having boys sing individually in front of their peers unless you ask them to. One of the worst things that you can do, because you know it's probably your worst memory, maybe from last week, is when the choir sector director goes down the road, sing it, sing it, sing it, sing it, sing it. You all know, I mean, you see the faces, the looks on your faces right now. You know that moment. Don't ever do that to a kid. Uh, so a couple structural things that we can think about. Um, boys say that singing, whoa, singing itself isn't feminine, sissy, or gay. But, but uh, we, we know that feminine or masculine qualities are ascribed to, foremost, the private versus the public experience of music. Remember that idea of I'll sing in the shower by myself? I like singing, but I'm not going to do it in front of other people. Does all singing have to be in a choir rehearsal that leads to a performance? Or can you have a choir that doesn't actually perform until the kids say they're ready? Might that answer be different for different kinds of choirs? Boys suggest that they have uh, group singing, group choral voice lessons that don't necessarily require that I sing on stage. Might that be an option? for some of your choirs. Uh, uh, we know that uh, a preponderance of our literature uh, assumes that boys don't join chorus because they'll be perceived as homosexual. The current narrative research indicates while that might be true for some boys, it's not true for most. So the research doesn't back up the stereotype of why boys drop out of choir. Uh, this boy from England said, when boys say, ooh, choir boy, it's so annoying, it's such crap. I used to turn around and thump them, but now I've learned to go, oh, just shut up. And it's become kind of a kind of witty banner. Uh, boys tell me that, they're, that in middle school that our self-esteem education is working pretty well because they get it when they're picked on and teased. They're just like, well, that guy just doesn't have good vocabulary skills. He couldn't think of anything better to call me. So, and that's coming up a lot in their literature, and I think that's a good thing that's coming out of our self-esteem um, work. Boys say that, that athletics and sport exert a strong pull on adolescent boys because of the ability to capitalize on the developing musculature, the precise feedback, ding, 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 of coaches and the camaraderie of teammates. So the implication is here that we need to emphasize the physical nature of singing through a careful analysis of the vocal skills needed to sing each phrase of music. You're hearing that on stage. You're thinking, what, what, what's go, what had to go into that phrase to make it sound like that? That's the level of detail that we need to uh, bring to our rehearsals. It's not just, okay, well, today let's start on page three. What are we going to learn on page three? What are the problems that we foresee on page three? And how are you going to teach us around those problems before we turn to page three? That's your lesson planning. So I would suggest that at core of the lesson planning is emphasize the physical nature of singing. Boys offer no agreement on the desirability of single-sex choirs from this research. Uh, the relationships, however, matter more than who is in the ensemble. Uh, so offer a mixture of choral ensemble configurations, sectional rehearsals, and small group work. So the answer to the question, do boys prefer single gender or mixed gender choirs? The answer is no, what they do like is a mixture of them. So a final thought here. This conversation made me think about how much of choral music, although it does not seem like a very big thing, how much it shapes your life, gives you commitment. It's given me social and analytical skills. I'm finding that it's quite a noble idea. When you're starting, you have to stick it out well in choir, but you reap the benefits once your voice has gone through the change. I'm so glad that my parents started me singing as a boy and encouraged me to keep singing even when I thought the voice change should make me stop. Singing all the way through was a very good thing for me. I can see that now. That's your job. The other key element there is we know that boys are more successful when they sing throughout the voice change and throughout adolescence into different levels of staging, uh, of schooling, but it's possible that a boy will drop out. When that boy comes to you, opens the door, and said, I have something to tell you. I'm dropping on a choir, and you say, why? 
and he says, because I'm going to join the football team. That kid's gone from your choir right now. You're not going to change his mind. Research shows, boys tell us, that it's how you respond to that moment that will determine whether he considers a singer, himself a sing as a singer, when he's 33 years old, or 43 years old, or 53 years old. They'll remember that moment. I'm so glad you're taking football. That's amazing. You are going to develop so, such great skills, and you know what? When you're done, I'm still here, and that door's still open. And I want you back. And maybe we can find a way for you to do both. But if you're going to do football, you better darn do it well. And I'll be there cheering. That's the message. Because, you know, another thing about adolescence is they change their mind a lot. Um, he may be back in the next day. But it's that relationship with you that matters. It's your response to the boy that matters. And even when everything goes wrong, focus on that relationship Learn what you can about that boy and how to help that boy and bring that to the table the next day. Bring that to the table every day. Bring your best. Thank you very much.